Um, we're really delighted to have you here and we're delighted to have our panellists here as well. Um, I'm going to ask them to start with a, a fairly kind of brief introduction, a little bit of information about where they started, how they got to where they are now. Um, and also we asked for questions in advance and lots of people were asking about different degree subjects. Um, does it matter if I've studied politics or something different? Do I need a master's degree? What options are available? So as our panelists talk about their career history, I'm going to ask them just to mention what, what they studied, if they think it matters, if they think a master's degree is important. I know we've got a bit of a mix of our panelists of different jobs um, and different career paths. So, so hopefully we'll have some interesting um, answers to that. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks, Becca, and, and thanks for having me on today. Um, so yeah, just a very brief kind of introduction. Uh, I'm a, a projects manager and also a research analyst uh, in the Africa programme here at Chatham House. Um, for those of us, for those of you who haven't heard of uh, Chatham House before, our official name is the, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Uh, we're a policy institute or a think tank um, providing kind of research and, and convening on key international relations issues. Um, I think in terms of kind of the general the topic of today um, around careers in policy, I think just to, to say up front, uh, we're not an implementation organization, so we don't kind of carry out policy interventions directly. Um, we're a charity, um, and, but we're also not a kind of advocacy organization. So we're fully independent. We don't take kind of institutional positions on particular um, issues, but we're in this kind of uh, space in between academic uh, research and, and policy makers. So we're trying to provide um, solid evidence, recommendations, give a kind of platform um, for dialogue on policy issues. Um, and that's where the Chatham House rule also comes in, which, uh, which may be familiar to some of you. Um, in terms of my own role, I've been working here for four, four years now. Um, I did a, a master's at Cambridge in international relations in 2017-2018. Uh, uh, I handed in my thesis and I started uh, here as an intern uh, the very next day um, in the Africa program. Since then, I've worked across uh, several roles in the team um, and that's given me the opportunity to work across a range of different projects, international conferences, um, research outputs across uh, multiple countries uh, in Africa. So I'll stop there for now, but looking forward to uh, the Q&A and to, to hearing from uh, my fellow panelists. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate in the in the panel. Um, so my name is Katinka. I uh, started out as a physicist and came to Cambridge uh, initially to do a PhD in uh, history and philosophy of science um, and had a JRF at uh, Darwin College. Um, and then at some point I changed my mind about what I wanted to do with my working life uh, and changed into law. I did a postgraduate diploma in law at uh, Nottingham Law School uh, on a distance learning basis. And then got my first job at uh, Oakington um, uh, Detention Center for Asylum Seekers um, just outside of Cambridge and uh, volunteered for a number of refugee um, legal aid organizations in Egypt and in South Africa, in Uganda. Came back to Cambridge to do an LLM in public international law. And since then I've been working in the field of um, refugee legal aid and research. Uh, joined Human Rights Watch where I had a fellowship um, then moved to the Norwegian Refugee Council in, um, in Geneva. And since 2011, I've been working in the uh, policy and law service of, uh, of UNHCR, of the UN Refugee Agency, where I'm responsible for, um, for researching the conditions in the countries of origin of asylum seekers. And, um, supervising, overseeing the work on uh, the positions that UNHCR takes on the um, on those conditions and on what that means for asylum seekers and their needs to be recognized as, as refugees. Uh, actually, I come from an engineering background uh, and uh, what I, uh, from a chemical engineering background to be clear, and I felt that there was a need for me personally to work with more people. So uh, I took interest in uh, psychology. I did a master's in psychology. 
and I moved on to pursue research roles in uh, India uh, briefly uh, in the Indian Institute of Technology, later in the Indian Institute of Management, where I worked in different fields like communications, business policy, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know design thinking uh, briefly. And then I, while I was working there, I took a deep interest in uh, you know how the government in India was changing, governance in India was changing, and I felt personally that if I could combine, if I could understand uh, policy through research, through a researcher's lens, it would aid me really well. But I wasn't uh, qualified in public policy, so I applied to LKY school, uh, got a full scholarship, uh, and I pursued my master's there. And since then, uh, uh, I've been working in the tech policy sector because I got interested in the innovation and how governments change and evolve and adopt innovations. Uh, since my graduation, I worked briefly in uh, a Singapore-based uh, consulting firm who work with uh, leading tech policy uh, technology companies uh, who are uh, you know working across Asia. So I was covering around 11 countries and the policy developments in South and Southeast Asia. And after that, uh, I decided to you know uh, take a research branch branch once over again. Uh, I applied to Asia House. Uh, I got a fellowship where currently I'm exploring uh, the impact of cross-border health data sharing on digital health innovations in Asia. And I'm studying six countries at this point. I'm two months into the projects. So I'm very new. But I hope to achieve a good result from this project. Thank you. I'm Roberto Rosas. I am the Director of Global Advocacy at the Institute of Internal Audit. And uh, it's a professional association with global headquarters in the US, 115 affiliate organizations around the world. And we comprise of about 220,000 members. Um, my role is to help our affiliate organizations uh, develop and implement public policy strategies. So that comprises of 115 different jurisdictions that uh, I get to learn about and work with our partners with. And it's very interesting because I get to know about different legislatures, regulators, and political structures, and I help our members um, protect the interests of the profession. And for those of you who don't know, internal auditing is an independent objective assurance and consulting activity designed to add value to organizations and their operations. And in terms of what I studied and how I got to public policy, I studied business administration with an emphasis in accounting. And I actually spoke at one of the major profession associations for accounting, uh, one of their conferences, and the director of political affairs came up to me afterward and said, I want you to work for me. And so that's how I got connected with that world here in Washington, DC. Uh, what followed after that was uh, working as a lobbyist for that association, then working on Capitol Hill as a congressional staffer um, in my hometown member of Congress's office. Uh, after that, uh, the timing was very good. I had someone reach out to me and ask if they could submit my resume to the Biden-Harris transition team, and I said, why not? Um, and shortly thereafter, I started with the Biden administration uh, at a federal agency working in congressional affairs. And since July of last year, I've been in this role at the IAA. So I'm very excited to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. I feel a bit stitched up now, having to follow the uh, follow the Biden guy. But uh, <laughs> I'm just just uh, I'm associate director of education at a UK-based firm called Public First. Uh, we primarily do pol policy work informed by public opinion. So uh, we run a lot of our own polling. We run a lot of focus groups, and we help organisations then work out from that what they should do about their policy challenges. Um, I had a bit of a circuitous route to a policy job. Um, I, when I graduated from Cambridge, I had a history degree. Uh, I knew two things. I didn't want to do any more studying for a bit and I wanted to stay in Cambridge and that was it. Um, I hadn't kind of done a huge amount of careers planning. So I stayed at the university um, as a school liaison officer for Downing College. Uh, I did a lot of work with UK schools on 
widening participation, widening access uh, to Cambridge and to other kind of high tariff universities in the UK. Um, that kind of exposed me, I guess, to a, a lot, a kind of broad range of the education sector in the UK. And from there, I've sort of fallen sideways into a, an education policy job, um, picking up a master's along the way, which I did part time at Birkbeck. Um, so, yeah, a little bit different to the rest of the panel, but uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, all interesting. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panellists. And hopefully from the mix um, of different things that they've studied and different things that they've done, I think our audience might be picking up that um, there are lots of different routes into lots of different kinds of policy work. So in answer to that question of do I need a master's degree in public policy? Not necessarily, um, although um, in, in some cases it might be helpful. Unsurprisingly, in the questions we gathered in advance, um, lots of people were saying just an idea of what your job involves we've got quite a wide range of different jobs um, across the panel what does a day in the life look like yeah so a day in the life um, I think there's quite a lot of variation in my role um, I have a dual role in some ways so I work um, across I work on both the project side and, and the research side um, so you know usually my my days kind of um, consist of a of a mix of the two, I could be working on um, projects administration that might involve, um, you know, setting up a, a roundtable meeting um, somewhere uh, in uh, somewhere in Africa. In in this case, at the moment, um, it's working on uh, a series that we're um, putting together on uh, the international relations of Tanzania. So trying to plan plan out travel and um, and design kind of speakers and agendas. Uh, and then on the on the research side, it um, you know a mix of things, kind of trying to keep on top of uh, of current uh, events that are going on and and significance of those. It may be that uh, there may be a media request, there may be um, a written piece um, that I'm working on, or or a podcast interview, or something similar to do as well. So, um, so usually it's a mix of that kind of um, more administrative side and um, I guess that more research focus uh, side. But I yeah I enjoy that that aspect of it to to mix things up. Um, like Fergus, my, my days also look quite differently. Uh, we work normally on um, longer range research projects that, where we are more in control of our own timetable and our own schedule. So we will be working for months sometimes on research on one and the same country of origin for major caseloads of asylum seekers when we see large numbers of people fleeing a particular country such as Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or Somalia. Uh, but there's also some very fast paced uh, work. Uh, if we uh, intervene in uh, a court case, for example, in national courts or in regional uh, courts or international courts, um, then we don't set the timetable. It's the court that determines when we need to submit um, our papers. And that can be very fast paced. Um, similarly, if we have to respond to policy decisions made by uh, governments, we'll be working very closely uh, from here at headquarters with our offices in the country or countries concerned. Uh, and so, for example, when the UK uh, made an announcement about wanting to uh, have asylum seekers processed in Rwanda, uh, UNHCR, of course, wanted to respond to that. Similarly, very recently with the, the announcements uh, in the United States about uh, the management of the border, UNHCR will respond quickly. Um, and so then it's, it's uh, the day looks very differently. I'll be in touch with colleagues uh, in very different time zones uh, to um, put out a statement as quickly as we can. Uh, and in between, um, there are internal policy discussions within UNHCR and on how to respond to uh, bigger issues such as climate change and how that affects the work we, we do. So yeah, I, it's often very difficult to predict in the morning what the, uh, what the day is going to, to look like, but it's never boring. I can share uh, two different experiences, you know, because prior to starting the fellowship, I was working with a consulting firm. So when you're working as a policy researcher with a consulting firm, the a day looks very different. It's pretty fast paced because uh, 
firstly, as a researcher, you are supposed to keep up to date with you know the the policy developments in the country of uh, which countries you are focusing on. And uh, second is there will be sudden client demands on specific issues they are looking at and specific geographies they want to understand. Uh, specific uh, regulations and their guidelines that might have come up and they want more clarity on them. And they may also want to quickly connect with a local stakeholder whom uh, as a researcher, as well as, you know, working with a consulting firm, I need to identify very specifically and share with them on time. So that is something which uh, you'll, you'll uh, realize when you work with tech companies, which are very, fa which are very fast based uh, work quick paced work so and they want quick uh, turnovers and you know outcomes uh, when it is uh, the current my current work is as a research fellow which is uh, this project is completely being directed by me so as a result i decide the timeline uh, and my day current day-to-day uh, -day activities look like uh, most of the time i'm working on the report uh, i'll uh, based on the stage i'm in the next stage where i'm connecting with stakeholders so on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm talking to different stakeholders uh, in some six countries uh, to understand, uh, you know, the, the healthcare scenario in those countries, the health policy issues, and specific to my topic, which is, you know, health data sharing and digital health innovations. So I'm talking to several different stakeholders, so that makes my work very interesting on a day-to-day -day basis. Day-to-day uh, -day in my life uh, can really vary as well, I'd say. Sometimes they start early in the mornings because we have people who are in, in different time zones. And so it's nice to be able to get to work with people who uh, are in Asia or Africa and, and, and start the day. And then uh, with uh, an issue that maybe they have in their parliament, whether there's a, a bill that perhaps needs uh, amending so that it can uh, we can mitigate risks to our profession uh, and then maybe ending with something uh, in, in South America to uh, focus on regulations and, and see how we can uh, influence that process. I think the most interesting thing for me is seeing that we can make a difference in all of this. And given that government puts up our proposed rulemaking, we build coalitions, we work with other stakeholders to analyze the impacts of what certain um, policies effects would be and you know putting forth our own suggestions and uh, representing the voice of the profession uh, as we are one institute I think is uh, really rewarding. Um, public first is a, is a consultancy so we have kind of consultancy model um, if you've ever looked at one of the big consultants so sort of your McKinsey's or Bain's and thought that looked interesting but the work itself looked quite boring I can recommend policy consultancy it's the kind of perfect mash of the two um, so we have a range of clients from across the education sector the day therefore normally starts sort of tracking or checking what's going on with with the things they are most interested in uh, so recently that's been I work particularly for universities at higher education institutions so announcements on changes to policy around international students are all you know really interesting uh, things about fees and funding developments in research policy um, that are coming out of, of government especially as the UK government has kept changing over the past three months that's kept us um, particularly busy we do a mix of projects so policy projects on a specific issue where we will go and test an issue test messages find where the electoral coalition for that might be find you know what groups of people in the uk you know find particularly interesting or important um again for universities it's often about how the university might be perceived in their local area or across the uk or internationally it's kind of a bit of reputation and how that links to policy as well um and then i suppose the third part of the job is um we do quite a lot of our own advocacy and writing about policy issues. So these tend to be, you know, range from reflections on things that have just happened through to particularly kind of wonkish pieces about a particular policy area that we find particularly interesting, but, but potentially not many other people do for sector or trade pets. Uh, it's kind of writing in, in my own name um, about a kind of higher education issue or an education policy issue. Um, and then usually by then it's about six o'clock and you can uh, clock off and go to the pub. 
thank you to all our panelists. So um, we know Chatham House has got their, their 12 week um, fellowship, which I think is opening quite soon. It says January 20, 2023, it's, it's gonna be advertised, but are there other internship opportunities? Is there anything you did that's helped you to get into work now, particularly in this policy area where there isn't necessarily a lot of um, internships? So I'll start with Fergus, but if our other panelists want to talk about that, um, please do come in afterwards. Sure. Um, so I think the the main thing that I I would want to say about this is, uh, you know, I think when I certainly when I was kind of uh, leaving after or kind of coming to the end of my master's, you know, looking at wanting to um, to work in kind of the international affairs sector, I think it can be quite um, intimidating to an extent. It can feel like there's a lot of barriers to um, to getting involved that you might you might feel that you need, you know. In, international experience, you might feel that you need um, experience within the specific um, sector. Neither of those were really um, true in my case. I, I had some experience working um, in an MP's office over the summer, but other than that, I had kind of, um, you know, a regular um, summer job outside of my, my studies um, working in retail. Um, and I think just the, the important thing um, or the important lesson to say out of that is that I think that, you know, the vast, vast majority of people that apply for roles, um, you know, in international affairs at Chatham House elsewhere um, have strong degrees in, in multiple, you know, in, across different subjects, have, you know, good research skills, um, all the rest of it. And I think what often can set you apart is um, administration skills, showing that you have, um, skills in terms of organization in terms of um being able to um to organize and, and run and manage kind of projects on that side of things and i think um that's where you know i think that those are actually the areas where you can set yourself apart um rather than necessarily needing kind of you know it is useful to have um to have internships uh, elsewhere you know in, in within the sector i'm sure but but i think um, a lot of the job is that administrative side, and I think um, that you know certainly people without um, without that access at you know at a certain stage um, shouldn't be disheartened or feel that there's a there's a major barrier to them um, getting involved in in the sector. So I think it's about leveraging those skills um, that you have um, outside of that. But but that said, I think there's lots of um, internship opportunities across. Um, you know, uh, RUSI, um, the Royal United Services Institute, um, across lots of the other think tanks um, based in London and, and elsewhere should run uh, similar schemes. Kind of vaguely answers the question, um, but happy to uh, uh, follow up on that by, by email or, or LinkedIn or, or anything else if I can be a more. Thanks, Fergus. And actually that picked up on a question that we had um, submitted before the panel, which was about what can organisations do to kind of support underrepresented groups um, to enter policy. And you've already touched on that. And I, I believe I'm right in saying Chatham House has made some changes to its um, uh, entry requirements where they no longer require a degree as part of that. So, so some really interesting stuff going on there. Um, I can see Jess with a hand up, so I'll come to you now. But if any of our other panellists, and I know Roberto and Emma, and I'm sure others, have done some work with underrepresented groups would be would be really nice to hear from you on on that point as well jess yeah sorry to jump in i think i'm just reflecting on what fergus was saying one of the hardest things i think about someone who wants knows they want a career in policy at this stage is that there aren't very many entry-level positions you know there, there are not a huge number of graduate roles there are not big graduate schemes um so i'd almost you know don't be afraid I think if you if you know you want to do policy and you know in what sort of area the kind of work experience in a career that may not immediately be in a kind of policy organization as you perceive it um, but is in, in something broader maybe in a larger company maybe in a slightly different way you know I think most I'm thinking of most of the hiring we do at Public First we're quite a small firm but we tend to pick people who have done one or two jobs in a relevant or associated area even if that wasn't a policy role if that makes sense um, so I think almost there is you know a huge amount of competition for some of these internships and, and kind of entry entry places so don't don't be worried about spending a couple of years 
somewhere else in the field uh, and then kind of coming back into it. I, I'd say in the United States, Hispanics and Latinos are considered underrepresented groups and minorities. Um, and here in Washington, there are a number of different programs uh, that one can participate in. I know there are things like the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute that offers programs. Um, there are a lot of other kinds of institutes and associations that are looking to bring uh, different kinds of people in to represent their interests. And that's a really great way to get to Washington, DC, or any other city, um, meet a lot of different people, learn about policy issues, learn about the policymaking process, uh, work with the press, and, and develop your skills to eventually become a public policy professional. And you know, my, my route, I guess, within the CPA profession was more through uh, a different program. Um, it was bringing together young CPAs, uh, but again, at profession associations, um, what they do is they have these organizations, uh, sorry, events called fly-ins. So that basically means they bring in a group of members uh, to advocate for their profession. And eventually, I think professions speak with uh, politicians and policymakers. So let's say my uh, former profession, the accounting profession, uh, while I was working to become a CPA, Eventually, I, I could have, you know, let's say, risen through the ranks uh, at an accounting firm and then participated in these fly-ins. Um, but realistically, what happens is if you enter the political realm at a younger age, you're already meeting with CEOs if you're working with a member of Congress. You're learning from company leadership on what their issues are. And so I guess to bring this back to minorities and underrepresented groups, I think since we don't necessarily have those professions historically in our families, I think it's ultra important for people to find these kinds of programs and, and participate in this process and, you know, learn more about the profession. And I think the earlier that you start, um, the better. So you can decide if that's right for you. And if not, eventually when you are that company leader or you're that CEO, you know a little bit more about it and what, what it consists of. My experience actually is uh, I learned from one of my friends uh, who was in Myanmar. Uh, he's a he's a doctor. He's a public health professional prof professional there. But uh, one way that uh, he took to policy was by working for international organizations who were uh, based out of Myanmar. So uh, was already well aware of the local context, the local challenges. But uh, since he got the support and aid, and you know the kind of access to professional networks through the international organization, he could. Uh, kind of enhance his uh, connections and, uh, you know, travel to different places, gain more experiences. And he's currently kind of working in uh, conflict zones, mostly where healthcare uh, professionals are required. We've got um, one here, which I'm going to start with, uh, Katinka, but again, please, everyone um, do jump in, um, about whether it's better to kind of frame yourself as a generalist or a specialist. I don't think there is really a, a best strategy. I think this panel also shows that there are really a lot of different pathways into policy work, fortunately, and that it's a bit scary, but it also means that it's not like there's only one pathway and you have to make all the right decisions because otherwise it's never going to happen. I see a lot of people nodding on the panel, so I'm glad. If I look around at my colleagues, also people have really taken very different uh, path, both in terms of the degrees they did and their first types of work experiences. I would say that if there is a general issue, uh, a theme or a topic, or a particular part of the world that really interests you, like from the get-go, then then absolutely go with that and then try and specialize as quickly as you can. Um, but I think for many people, that's not the case. It's more the general interest in policy work and trying to influence different stakeholders um, on whatever topic or even in whatever part of the world. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong if that's the case in, in just flagging to potential employers that that's precisely what you think you're, you're going to be good at and that you're interested in. Um, there is always, it's a bit difficult to get started. That is just true for everybody. 
I think internships are a great way of also working out what it is that you really like um, and whether there is a particular topic or a different a particular country or region, continent that grabs your attention. Uh, but I wouldn't really stress too much about having to frame things in this way or, or that way. Um, honestly, there is just so many different career paths that it's, it will either way can, can work out. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and again, you know, our other panelists do, do shout if you've got something to add. Um, and I should have said part of that question actually was about whether it's beneficial to kind of specialise early or whether that might actually be a negative thing if you specialize too early and, and sort of cut off roots um so i, I don't know if you've, you've got any thoughts there sorry to put you on the spot again or indeed anyone else um fergus a, your, your your microphone's yeah, up. happy to add on that i mean i think on the point about limiting uh career options i i would say um no in my experience i think that you know, from an, ex from an external perspective, it can sometimes be um, difficult to, or you can underestimate the level of kind of internal um, complexity and bureaucracy of kind of big NGOs and, and international organizations. Um, maybe that's Katinka's experience as well in, the, uh, in UNHCR, but certainly I think um, being within an organization at, at an entry level in in a certain department whatever that might be and understanding how that uh how that organization functions and um how the different departments fit together and um and the kind of the structure internally i think that's actually a, a really valuable thing and i've certainly seen colleagues um across chatham house move between different departments different thematic departments and having that um internal awareness and that kind of knowledge of the of the structure and and the way that the organization functions is ultimately um invaluable and and you know uh so i think in terms of that that point about limiting yourself by by specializing too early i think there is um there are certainly uh, other skills that you pick up and and that you can adapt and and use to kind of move across I'm, I'm trying to combine a couple of questions together to, to get the most out of it. Um, so we've got one which is about um, anything you might recommend to do straight out of university, but also another one about how long people tend to stay before moving on to something new. And, and I wonder if uh, any of our analysts feel they could answer one, one or the other. I'm going to put them both together as, as career progression questions. I think the most important thing if you are feeling a, again a bit unsure about the policy area you want to go in which specific bit of policy whether you want to be doing pure research more of the advocacy side more on the comms and campaign side is to find a job that is interesting to you and where you are learning new things and then when you stop learning new things to move to another organization or to a different role i think the from what i can see across the sector is that is that people tend to do quite short stints um, pick up a load of new information, new skills, new policy area, and then sort of almost move themselves on a bit. Um, I don't know if colleagues have kind of felt felt the same or felt, but it, it's quite a dynamic sector. Um, and if you just sort of know broadly that this is this is what you want to do, um, take something that looks interesting to start with, but then don't be afraid to after sort of eighteen months, you know, two years. Um, you know, move yourself and start building the, the portfolio because what you'll find is is when you start in a role you'll think one thing about you know about policy area you'll learn a lot about it you'll meet a lot of interesting people and it might take you off in a completely new direction um, so I think a lot of the kind of policy careers that I've seen you know, tend, tend to be quite fluid and quite flexible um, but that, I guess that's what makes it fun. Uh, actually I've experienced it you know uh... Before I think uh, studying public policy, my focus was mostly in research and I wanted to pursue policy research from the very beginning. But I think after the after finishing a policy course, you're suddenly open to so many different opportunities. So something that really came my way was about uh, a consulting uh, kind of a research analyst role in a consulting firm. So. Uh, which is slightly different, you know, as Jess earlier mentioned, it's a combination of the best of, uh, you know, the real world and the, you know, academia in some sense. And uh, 
however what ha- the thing is uh, i happened to stay for more than like for nearly 3 years but still i wanted to come back to policy research like there's something always at the at your heart that you know that calls you that a calling that you want to go back to so i had to go back to research so uh, that usually happens but of course you know uh, i think one thing that's good about gaining new experiences is that uh, you gain different skill sets and of course you tend to if you are smart enough you can what you can really do is combine them eventually as you grow in your career and add keep on adding uh, more value to your own skills and apply them in a different setting perhaps so for example some of the skills i gained as part of the consulting firm while working for them was uh how to deal with uh different how to talk to different stakeholders how to understand their needs and talk to them accordingly and try to help them out in whatever way possible now that helps me when i'm talking to stakeholders as a researcher because now i want to ensure that they are comfortable they are uh, able to share their experiences in a comfortable way and at the same time uh i'm li- i'm learning the most from them uh about the field about the sector and their own experiences so you can kind of combine your skills as you continue along your career and kind of uh, expand your own skill set uh, eventually um maybe particularly for emma and roberto uh, does having political affiliations um and they've said does it lead to a lower chance of getting a, a public policy job but do you do you think it influences um uh, your job is that something that you found is um helpful unhelpful changes your career path a little bit i can um i can comment on the question about political affiliation so in the united states we're we're slightly partisan i don't know if you all have heard um but there are some differences between uh, republicans and democrats and independents um i would say there there are kind of these sort of unofficial rules that people say for instance if you're a member of congress or you're a member of parliament is of one party i think you get the chance to switch once um i i think you can definitely choose who who you want to work for and kind of map out the career process there but ultimately i'd say this really is a a timeline question because what i find is i do see that people have worked in partisan politics or they work with a uh, a certain party and and they kind of grow their career from there as emma mentioned there are plenty of opportunities irrespective of which uh party you choose um but let's say after some of the more partisan work that you do it you kind of level out because policy shops typically uh hire from both parties so you'll have a team of two republicans or two democrats or let's say two people who have worked on on either side of the aisle uh or for a, a given party just to make it more international so i I think yes it definitely does help. Um I was somewhere in the middle and um but I think that also helps too. But ultimately it's really about being able to collaborate with other parties and other people uh in a professional way. I don't think you have to pin your kind of political colors to the mast mast at all. Uh you don't have to have a political affiliation. It's not necessarily damaging if you do. But I think what is really important is sort of general political awareness of of all the parties of the main issues in your policy area be that international domestic um you know being able to to think in a, in a political way and to be interested in the politics of the policy as well I think everyone here on the panel has kind of mentioned in some way that they're interested in you know a regulation or a bill or a, what a minister said um that kind of interest in politics you know I think I think is really really helpful um but it doesn't have to be partisan uh and if you want it to be partisan you know there are lots of jobs in you know, especially in the think tank world where you can you know start on the left or on the right and sort of start in, a, in an ideological way uh, but there's also lots of options where you know, you know i work with colleagues who have worked for the labor party work for the Liberal Dems, work for conservatives they're now all sit next to each other and try not to fight too much um but uh, yeah there's lo- lots of different options yeah, I would say uh, for UNHCR, and I, I'm pretty sure it's the same for the other UN agencies, it's not at all an obstacle in any way to have had a political affiliation uh, before joining UNHCR. But once you join, uh, you have to position yourself as uh, apolitical. It's part of our code of conduct that we all sign up to. 
Um, so for the duration of your employment with UNHCR, and again, I'm pretty sure it's the same for the other UN agencies, uh, you are a non-political animal. We've also had a question to move back to our, our policy researchers somewhat. Um, oh, let me find it. Um, about kind of sources and methods that you use for your research. And um, if somebody doesn't have any kind of social science background, um, would that be uh, a disadvantage in your work? I'm from the qualitative side. Uh, I think beginning uh, my career and as well as uh, while navigating through organizations, one disadvantage I realized is not uh, having uh, been on the quantitative side or uh, having had experience there. So because uh, I think uh, that's uh, like being on the qualitative research side, the benefit is that you are able to uh, kind of bring in a unique set of methods. For example, you are using interviews, you are go go doing field research, you're actually talking to stakeholders and identifying the problem, the different lenses uh, of the problem as well as you know uh, what can be uh, the direction in which what directions policies can take to address that particular problem that is one uh, from a quantitative side of course you're strong on the numbers you have more evidence in convincing policymakers uh, so that is a clear distinction uh, about the two but of course you're not uh, always coming to policy research being an expert in methods in one way or the other uh, you can basically take a brief, uh, a basic course, start gaining experience, perhaps an internship, perhaps perhaps a short term role, and then use that experience and the connections you have made there to move on to, you know, a full fledged uh, research role. It can you can start with uh, junior roles and move on to senior research analyst roles in, let us say, you know, uh, consulting firms can be one place where you gain a diverse range of experiences. Uh, you can of course work in academia where you know there are sp uh, very uh, there are there are centers of excellence where you can work and you can explore specific areas of policy like for example it can be health uh, policy or it can be education policy or it can be you know tech policy which is uh, an emerging area of public policy and uh, like uh, well paid or uh, well paid as well you know to some extent so uh, because uh, why i say that is because uh, if someone's interested in uh, a specific area of policy, uh, you'll have to look for uh, organizations working there and the kind of skill sets they are looking for, which may differ from one area to the other. So that is also something to keep in mind. But of course, you are not always coming into research knowing everything. You basically carry on with your motivation, your ability to learn and adapt, as well as you know, uh, continue to grow uh, and explore. Uh, the different methods that can be used in your area of interest within policy, as well as what your the organizations you are interested in working for. What they, what is it that they would like for you to use? Like for example, if it's a consulting firm, they want you to use mixed methods to some extent, uh, and uh, they may want to uh, place you specifically for consultations if you are a qualitative person versus you know if you are doing back uh, back end research. You may, they may expect you to be well versed in the quantitative side because you are preparing uh, evidences, uh, evidence based reports, you know, for policymakers. So these are the different areas you can explore. But first, you should be clear about your specific area of interest uh, within uh, public policy because things change depending on the specialization. Yeah, just to confirm, that is very true for UNHCR as well. I, I answered in, in writing to, to this question also. Like my research now at UNHCR is almost entirely desk-based, but I have worked for NGOs in particular where the entire credibility of the research relied on being in the field and doing field-based research. But at UNHCR, it's a massive organization. I have 20,000 colleagues. Um, and some of those work on public health issues, for example, and so their research methods are entirely different from, from mine. I have colleagues working on, uh, on education, on nutrition. Um, there's a lot of legal interventions on all kinds of, of subjects on, on what we call housing, land and policy. So there's a lot of research also that is very field based, that is really dealing with data collection through surveys, um, very different from the research I do. So if you have an interest in particular research methods, then there is also an opportunity to adjust um, 
within the organization. We have a rotation policy in place within UNHCR. So all staff, almost all staff rotate uh, around the world and they rotate from one job to the next. Uh, and the idea is that people get exposed really also to different elements of what UNHCR does. So it's perfectly possible within a career within UNHCR to also do different types of, uh, of research in, in different positions. Thank you. I was also at this point going to ask one of the questions that came in on our, our pre-survey, which is a sort of what do you wish you knew before you went into your this phase of your career? Um, or what advice would you give to someone, you know, or to your younger self? Um, and I might ask that to everyone as we as we start to kind of draw to a bit of a close. I think the biggest piece of advice um, would be, or certainly for someone who's kind of emerging uh, from university, looking in at their kind of first first steps uh, um, into a career, would be, and in this sector especially, would be to not. Um, not think that you need to know it all or that you are expected to know it all, because I think that's often a concern that people really think that they need to have, um, they need to know everything, they need to show research um, experience and, and, and things on everything. But I think certainly for entry level um, jobs for getting kind of a foot on the ladder, um, I think the employer, and this is certainly the case for, for Chatham House, you know, they want to um, they want to know how the internship, how the job is going to benefit you as much as it's going to benefit uh, them. And that means showing that, you know, you don't know everything, but that you really want to learn and that, you know, that you that you are aware of that. And I think that's, um, yeah, that's a really, really important um, thing to keep in mind in this in this sector. You, you don't need to know everything when, especially not when you start out um, and you never will. So, yeah. I think I would have stressed a lot less about making the right decisions along the way if I had known in advance that um, my colleagues have such a diverse range of backgrounds. And that's really been true at the NGOs I, I worked at uh, and now very much also at, at UNHCR. Um, there is just such a wealth of, of, of experience and backgrounds that, that people have here uh, that to me now also when I speak sometimes through uh, the alumni um, channels for, for Cambridge University to current students, I do really emphasize that it's maybe this kind of being so unconstrained is a bit overwhelming, but it's also reassuring in the sense that I don't really think you can make wrong choices if you really are interested in this type of work. I think my main uh, advice is to just jump in and start somewhere even if you don't know exactly whether this particular area of, of work, particular topics is going, topic is going to interest you, I think it's better to just dive in and start somewhere and, and start acquiring experience. And then you can move sideways or upwards um, into other jobs rather than trying to work out exactly what it is uh, that your ideal job looks like. Uh, what I would uh, have... Uh thought you know you should know is one thing is when you start uh, particular, particularly in public policy I think I look at it like it's a magnifying lens almost like because I think it's kind of transparent depending on what object you are kind of uh, placing it on you'll see it differently like it's uh, up to you as to how you best make use of it at the same time you have to be flexible because I think uh, in the beginning, I remember that I was focused on social policy related roles at some at one point, but then I realized that I think you have to jump in just like you know, Katinka said, you have to jump in and you have to start somewhere. And that's when eventually I think you will uh, find uh, your something that you really like to work in, something that is uh, that makes sense to you, not just from uh, uh, you know, uh, your own uh, interests, but also something that's sustainable for you as a professional, because I think at the end of the day, you have to continue to earn, you have to continue to, you know, progress in your career at the same time, you have to make a, you, you need to make an impact uh, for the society. So all these three things, things have to come together. So you have to be practical as well as you have to be idealistic, but most importantly, you have to be flexible and adaptable, and you need to keep learning. 
because you need to keep learning and adapting because that's going to ensure that you go a long way in a public policy career. I think some helpful advice that someone shared with me was about the five P's of politics. So people, so arguably the most important. Um, the constituents are the stakeholders who are impacted by uh, politics and policy. Uh, policy, so the actual regulations or laws that are being promulgated. Uh, press, working with the press, making sure that ideas are communicated, that uh, stories are shared, um, and that people understand um, the narratives that belong to uh, your specific stakeholder. Um, then process. I'd say there are certain processes that are still to this day respected that initiated a long time ago. And you know whether that's through working through a committee, but just understanding how a law is made or how regulations are made and at which point you can intervene and, and make a difference. And then uh, politics are political savvy. So understanding the, the characters and the interpersonal dynamics and just how the ecosystem works. And so when you have that as a frame of reference, I think it's better to navigate throughout your career and um, you know just think about these things. And another piece of advice that someone shared with me was uh, be very choosy about who you decide to affiliate yourself with, uh, at least professionally, uh, at the start of your career, because especially in Washington, DC, it's a very small place as time goes on, people still remember you as being affiliated to a certain person or institution. And so, um, you know, as, as you're deciding where, where to go next, uh, you know, kind of map out what, what comes after that and, and how easily you can get there. And um, I'll stop there. If you are someone who is a kind of new graduate or you just finished an undergrad, maybe a master's, you know, you, you need to work out what your one thing is. So you either need to have a kind of background in a, in a policy area, maybe you don't have that, but you're quite good at data, maybe you don't have that, but you're quite good at, at research and synthesizing lots of information, you're a good writer, maybe you don't have that, but you are kind of a comms person and you kind of have a good eye for comms and political, you, you know, you need to work out what your, your sort of one thing is. And then as you kind of move between roles or work out your role and kind of your career develops, you sort of add stuff to that. Um, so particularly if you look at people who talk a lot about po policy, they tend to be able to do everything. Um, but to start with, kind of work out what your, your one thing is and then, and then use that to guide your choice of, of role, if that makes sense. Because you, you'll find a role that fits and where you can, as everyone sort of said, you know, a lot of this is, is learning as you go and, and finding that a benefit of the job rather than something that, that's, that's annoying. Um, the thing I wish I had done more of is writing and working out what my opinion on a policy area is uh, and kind of speaking about that so you know there's, there's no particularly good way of doing this I don't think you know blogging is quite uncool Twitter's a bit of a nightmare you know LinkedIn's far too earnest but if you can find so you know I'm a Twitter person still so that that's what fits my personality but if you kind of write and work out your opinion and work out what you want to say um, doing that early um, not necessarily with with a kind of arrogance but with a confidence that, that you know you have something interesting to say because because you probably do um so that, that'd be my kind of one thing I wish I wish I'd done more of I think maybe one piece of advice too that also often goes overlooked um but I think is pretty straightforward is be kind I think if you work in policy and, and politics you you meet a lot of different people and these people have long memories and I know because you are all affiliated with the University of Cambridge, and especially those of you who are at Downing College, uh, this will come second nature to you. But uh, if you can, uh, you know, show people and demonstrate people that you you are a kind person, and uh, you know, ex exhibit those behaviors, I think uh, people will have a favorable view of you, and 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 that serves you well. In addition to just simply being a, a good human being, so I I do want to share that as well.